Hello, and welcome to the BYU Family History Library webinar series. We're glad you could join us today. I'm Bryant, and I'll be your host for this webinar. Please make sure your microphones and web cameras are disabled during the presentation to provide for a smooth recording. If you have technical difficulties during the webinar, please use the chat box and I can address your concerns. You're welcome to use the chat box during the webinar for comments and insights. However, all questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. Our next webinar is going to be on June 3rd, how to use the Family Search Wiki and Catalog. And that'll be with Amber Oldenburg. And that'll be Wednesday at 5.30 p.m. And just as a note, our webinar uh, regular time is actually changing to Wednesdays at 5.30 p.m. for the rest of the summer. If you'd like to access a previous webinar, please visit our webinar index on our website or search on our YouTube channel. All of our webinars are recorded and uploaded by the following Monday for your convenience. We also post links to recordings and other updates on our Facebook and Twitter accounts. For today's webinar, we are pleased to hear from James Tanner, who will be giving a presentation on editing photos for genealogy. James has over 35 years experience in genealogical research and is an avid blogger of Genealogy's Star blog and rejoice and be exceedingly glad. He is an author and co-author of over 25 books on genealogical research and has presented at expos and conferences around the US, Canada, and Europe. He served for 10 years as a missionary at the Mesa, Arizona Family Search Library and is currently serving at the BYU Family History Library. James has seven children, 34 grandchildren, and one great-grandchild. And thanks for being with us today, James. If you're ready, we'll turn the time over to you. Get my screen selected here, and we'll get the... Since we're going to talk about photos today, I'm glad to be here for the BYU Family History Library webinar series, even though the, webinar, the library's been closed for a few months now. And uh, we're all waiting expectantly to have it open sometime in the future when we can actually go back and start helping people in the library. Um, today, we'll be talking about basic photo editing. And I've kind of aimed this at genealogists, so most of the photos will be historical kinds of photos, a lot of them from my own uh, family collections of of photos handed down to me by various people. One of my great grandmothers was a professional photographer for many, many years in Eastern Arizona. So a lot of these photos you'll see for, are from her uh, efforts of taking photos of people in Eastern Arizona over a period of about, uh, from around 19, uh, early 1900s. Her father was also a photographer. Uh, into the 1880s up to about 1940. So it's a rather major collection. Um, we've got, uh, we'll get right into it now and uh, learn a little bit about some of the photos. I thought I'd start out with uh, looking at some of the problems. Let me move my uh, cursor over to the side here so it's not in the way. Um, this is a uh, kind of classic problem, but uh, you probably might not be able to guess what happened here. Well, out of the, uh, aside from the fact that there was a lot of camera movement, meaning everything was equally blurred, uh, there's another major issue here, and that's this bar of light that's kind of between the kind of cuts off here. And what that indicates is that there was either a light leakage into the camera, which is entirely possible, meaning if you've dropped your camera, you may have some kind of crack or some way the light's getting in. Or it could be a shutter man malfunction, meaning as the shutter goes across, it may not go across or open at the same speed. And so as uh, the film is developed, is, uh, uh, is developed at a different in different bands as uh, if there's a shutter that goes. The shutters in some of the old cameras were uh, either an open aperture shutter where you clicked a button and open it and it opened uh, like a little circle around and the light went in, or there were slide shutters where the shutter moved sideways across the the uh, film, and so in this case it may have been that. 
kind of a shutter that uh, created that band of light. So this this is kind of a really uh, actually beyond hope uh, the restoration kind of problem with this particular photograph. Here's another one, and this one's underexposed among other things. It's also out of focus. Uh, but underexposure and overexposure are the two major problems. Now. You may think that some of these problems occur only with uh, like the older cameras where uh, they didn't have all the fancy electronics and uh, and it but that's not the case even the 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 best digital cameras today very high end professional digital cameras are still subject to being out of focus. <laughs> Sorry folks, you know even automatic focus sometimes doesn't work it focus on the wrong thing. And it may also, uh, you may also have camera movement. That's up to the individual person holding the camera. Uh, and under and overexposing can happen simply because you have the settings set incorrectly on your camera when you take the picture. But back in those days, this was a severe problem because uh, light meters were not common. There was not a way to measure how much light was, uh, was available. And the photographer really had to kind of guess as to the exposure. The film was rather slow, meaning it, it accepted the light image over a period of time, which was an appreciable period. Could be as long as one second if the light was dark or even longer. And uh, holding the camera still during that period of time was, was very difficult. So you're going to find a, a fair measure of, of uh, photos that have this this kind of particular problem. Uh, out of focus, um, this is like I mentioned just a moment ago, is, is a problem that occur, occurs today. I uh, take thousands of photos uh, and uh, there's always a percentage of them that are out of focus, regardless of how fast the focus mechanism is on my camera, uh, no matter how much, uh, how, how hard I try to keep the camera still. And a lot of times the, the camera will be out of focus. Um, and then you have some other problem that's physical damage to the photo. Uh, of course, the physical damage occurs after the photo's been printed and uh, probably not carefully stored. Uh, in this case, it's obvious that this photo was ripped in half and uh, kind of pasted back together. Um, now, some of these these problems can be resolved through uh, the post-production uh, phase of, of taking phot uh, photographs or working with photographs. In all these cases, we're working, I'm working with digital images, and I'll remind you of that from time to time. So these were originally either negatives or uh, photo prints on, on uh, paper or other substance and uh, they became, uh, and then they were digitized, um, most of which were digitized in a, on a flatbed scanner uh, at a pretty high resolution, usually four to 600 dots per inch. This particular photo has multiple problems. Uh, the main problem here is that uh, part, of the, part of the photo is overexposed and part of the photo is underexposed. In this case, we have all of these uh, people looking uh, with the camera looking directly into the sun, and their big hats have shaded out every one of the almost every one of the faces. And we can probably do some things with this photo, but not much. And we'll s see what we can do in just a minute as we get into it. So the real question here is: Can photos be fixed? Is there some process that we go through? to fix the photos? Um, and the answer, of course, is yes, or we wouldn't have this photo, this uh, webinar, because uh, the whole idea here is, is that there are ways to fix the photos. This particular photo uh, happens to be my grandfather and my father and my uncle in front of a wood pile. And um, uh, it's a very, uh, the faces are very dark, the detail is, uh, obscured because it's uh, a little bit underexposed. It's not completely underexposed or it wouldn't be salvageable, but it is a, a very interesting photo. 
So we need to know, first of all, what photos can't be fixed, I, that I can't fix at all. I can't fix an out-of-focus photo. There's no way to refocus an image that's already been been stored. Now, that's true on a uh, uh, camera, on a digital camera as well as on a, on a film camera. And so out-of-focus is really kind of the end of that image. Um, however, it should be noted that there is some technology today that is um, very advanced and some very relatively expensive cameras now have uh, a function on their digital function that will refocus an image even after it's been taken. Well, there's probably some real limitations on that on how badly it's out of focus, but uh, there's some some camera production that'll uh, produce a, uh, a a focused image even if the original was apparently out of focus. Obviously, if you're missing parts of the image, if you cut off somebody's head or slice somebody in half in the image or uh, or something standing in the way or whatever, all of that, those things cannot be resolved. They are simply gone. And so looking at an image uh, that has that kind of problem, there may be some some of the information in the image that you want to save, but uh, the image itself is probably not worth worth uh, storing and, and maintaining and keeping. Camera movement, that's again, there's a difference between out of focus and camera movement. Out of focus means that the lens is not set, set properly to focus the image on the, the um, substrate on either the sensor in a digital camera or the film in a film camera. Camera movement means the camera actually was moved by whoever was taking the picture. And it may have been in perfect focus, but because the camera moved, the image looks blurred. Overexposure on paper images. Uh, extreme overexposure where you have uh, almost white areas cannot be resolved out of paper images. There just is no information left in the overexposed areas. And so there's nothing to correct. There's nothing there you can find. You'll still have the same overexposed areas. But underexposing is another problem, but it, it's possible if it's dark, if the picture's too dark, to bring out part of the image. And this is mainly aimed at old paper images, but uh, I need to keep mentioning that there's some things that you can do with digital images that seem almost impossible with, uh, that would have been impossible with paper images. Overexposure in a in a digital image is not uh, fatal. Uh, you can uh, sometimes correct overexposure that ex seems extreme, and underexposure in a in a camera with a very uh, uh, sensitive uh, digital sensor, uh, high megapixel count can uh, can almost uh, see in the dark in dark. Uh, there are some new cameras, uh, for instance, the smartphone cameras with the iPhones and some of the other smartphones out there have uh, extremely sensitive uh, sensors. And uh, you can take pictures when you would otherwise not see any details with your eyes. It looked like it was completely dark and you can take a picture with the, those cameras and, and it look like it's almost daylight in broad daylight. So there's uh, there's some latitude with the digital images, but paper images are pretty well locked into what they're. Um, it's important to understand that there is a fixed amount of information in any photograph. Now, what does that mean? It means that when you take the image, uh, the light from the from the subject enters the camera and makes uh, creates an image on the substrate, which in most cases in this talking here about film. And so the image that's on the film is uh, uh, it takes a certain amount of the information from the actual physical image that's in front of it. So in this case, with these people standing there, these uh, old construction people that worked with them in uh, eastern Arizona, um, 
they, um, the amount of information is how much information there was in the, in the original scene. Obviously, you, if you were standing there, they would all be in color. There would be background. The sky would probably be cloudy or blue, and uh, you'd be able to see their faces, and it will look wonderful. But when you take the picture, it only, it only takes a fixed amount of that information. And no matter what you do, that's the end of the whole issue. You can only get back what was actually stored by the film. Now, if you go in and add information by post-production using a, a program uh, to modify and edit the photo, that's not part of the original photo. So this is the original photo, uh, as close as a digital reproduction can be. But it is, and uh, you can do a lot of things to these kinds, to this information that's here. But anything you actually add to it is not part of the original photo. And we'll get to talk a little bit at the end, if I have a little bit of time, about the ethics of, um, of working with historical photos, whether or not it's ethical to go in and change a photo uh, from the original. Um, another thing you might, I might mention at this point is that uh, what we see today in the world, uh, if you look at a magazine, a print magazine, or you look at uh, a photograph in a, a studio, or you look at uh, images on the computer, of which there are millions and billions of images, uh, it, it's almost certain that every image that you see today that originates in a digital image has been modified in some way after the from the original uh, scene. So what you're looking at is not uh, reality. There used to be a, a statement that said a picture was worth a thousand words. Well, right now, pictures are worth only what you actually see on the image because you, you have no idea what the original uh, scene looked like when you go looking at a digital image that's been run through uh, one of the, of the manipulation photo editing programs. Okay, so that <clears throat> that's kind of the limitation of what we're talking about. And I'm gonna emphasize here, I'm working from scanned images of paper photographs so that it's not something that I could digitally uh, manipulate. I was stuck with what was on the paper. So uh, we'll see what we can do with some of the paper images. Now here's a kind of a rule that I've uh, stressed for many years, and that is never, 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 and I say that three times because I could keep saying it, edit the original photograph, no matter how bad it is. That means that, and the question always comes up, should I keep the original photograph after I've digitized the photo? And the answer is always yes. If it has any conceivable historical or genealogical significance or value, it should be kept. We don't want to lose the paper photos. Why? Because digital images have a tendency to creep into changes that were not in the original. So we'll just have to uh, realize that this is, uh, no matter how bad that photo looks and how terrible it is, there's still information in that photo that cannot be uh, replaced. It's an irreplaceable single item. It was very unusual in the uh, in old days of photography, meaning anything pre-digital. Uh, some people would get a lot of copies of one photograph to send out for, uh, for a Christmas holiday type uh, card, or they might get a lot of copies to hand out to relatives of a specific photo, like a graduation photo or or uh, some something that was a very important event. Uh, but in most of the cases, uh, when you find a, a paper photo, uh, it is probably the only, it's very unique, it is probably the only copy of that particular photo in existence. So we don't want to edit it, we don't want to lose it, and we certainly don't want to throw it away. So those are things to do. Um, and 
if the original is a digital cop is a digital image always make a copy of the digital image before you do any any editing there are programs that will allow you to edit the the, the image without changing the original in other words it always preserves the original even though the uh, uh the image is being edited but a lot of the really especially the free or inexpensive uh, editing programs once you've edited that a digital image it's it's gone you never can get your original back so uh, especially if you save the copy over the original so make it make a copy if you want to play around with a photo and try to change it and edit it and, and uh, improve it if you want to call it that then um then make a copy before you start editing and if the original is paper don't cut it or otherwise change it um uh, unfortunately we have a rather front unfortunately from a genealogical standpoint other there are other considerations obviously but from a genealogical standpoint, we have people who uh, who cut photos up for scrapbooks and and uh, do things. But it's just for a, a genealogist, it gives them you know a lot of heartburn because uh, seeing that the photo has been cut around or made the person's head, and we've lost all the rest of the information in that photo, um, and that just is is a tragedy because those original photos cannot be replaced we cannot ever come back and find the originals sometimes uh, people have preserved and kept the negatives from which those photographs photographs were made um, but uh, it's even getting harder and harder today to find a, a good system for uh, digitizing the negatives and then reconstructing uh, the images, especially in color images, black and white images, it's not that difficult to to uh, reproduce the um, the image from a negative. But when you get into color, it's pretty hard to match the color that was printed the first time around. So, what are the programs out there that we could think about using? And uh, the basic ones, which are are uh, accepted or used by uh, probably the majority of everybody who's out there uh, seriously editing photographs are Adobe Photoshop or Elements, Adobe Photoshop Elements, which is uh, the less expensive version of the program, and Adobe Lightroom. Now, there are literally hundreds of other programs, and they're from free to very expensive. Uh, Adobe now does not sell their programs anymore. Uh, they only rent them out, which means that you are, they're all on a subscription basis. They have what is called the Adobe Creative Cloud. And when you have the Adobe CC or Creative Cloud, uh, at various levels, you can get access to various programs. If you have the complete cloud, you have access to oh, 30 plus Adobe programs. Uh, the the consideration here is is the cost of this, and it can be quite expensive. And when we're talking about having a subscription to Photoshop and Lightroom and a few other uh, photo manipulation programs uh, that are available, then it it comes out to quite a bit of money. But it is about the same as it would cost, or less than it would cost to purchase the programs and then upgrade them from time to time. So you know, if it's if it's a budgetary issue, then there are, like I said, hundreds of free photo programs out there. You can simply look for free photo um, editing programs, and you'll find just dozens and dozens of them out there to uh, to choose from. And so you know, some people like uh, certain other programs, and they are just you know they become uh, advocates for various programs. That are out there and so you know there's a lot to choose from it just takes some time and some effort uh, to review and understand and, and begin to work with some of the program some of them are extremely simple uh, a lot of the photo editing programs one that i use from time to time is uh, google photos um, i back up my photos onto uh, the google photos account and uh, 
uh, they have some very simple uh, photo manipulation um, uh, things on their program, some uh, features that, that allow you to uh, edit some of the things in photos, not prepare photos, not uh, you know overcome some of the problems that I've shown earlier in this presentation, but uh, they do have some things that will enhance the photos a little bit. And uh, they're adequate for some photos, and they work just fine. But uh, if you really want to get into the, the types of things that I'm showing here, uh, you're really going to have to face the fact that you need to, to uh, become involved in learning and developing some of these programs here. So what do we mean by basic editing? OK, so this is a photo of uh, the high school building uh, as it was years and years ago. It's still there. The same building's still there. It's no longer a high school. I have a new high school, but this is located in St. John's, Patchy County, Arizona, and it's the high school building. Um, and uh, the old one, you can see from the cars in the picture that uh, probably give you a time uh, date around the time, but uh, that was an old car when, the, when this picture was taken. That was not a new car, so you can have to kind of uh, extrapolate a date out of how old you think the car is and, and what's the, uh, what you're seeing there. Now, what's wrong with this picture? Well, it's a little bit overexposed. On And then let me show you here with my little marker here. You'll see there's a line down through the photo here. And if you look carefully, you can see there's another line through the photo here. That comes from light leakage or a malfunctioning shutter, as I mentioned earlier. And there's nothing really too much you can do about it. Uh, I could technically fix it if I wanted to spend uh, a couple of hours on this particular photo. I doubt that that would be worthwhile. But what I can do, what else is wrong? Well, uh, one interesting thing about the photos that I inherited from my grandmother was that many of them were uh, taken at an angle like this. That uh, I haven't ever been able to figure out whether the camera was somehow always took pictures at a, at an angle, or if she just simply didn't realize that she was holding the camera uh, at an angle. So it looks like they're kind of on the side of a hill here, but you know you can look at the trees and you don't see them growing up a little bit, you know leaning into it like they would if they were on a hill. So um, it's it's really not uh, a very pleasant looking photo. But what if I work on this photo with one of my programs? In this case, I would, I'm going to be using a program primarily called Lightroom, which is a very, very sophisticated Adobe program uh, and has almost the same and even uh, it's even simpler, but it's uh, almost the same functions as Photoshop. Um, but it just is a simpler way to, to edit the photos. What happens if I edit this photo now? So let's look and see what happens when the photo gets edited. Okay, so now you have uh, a photo that uh, looks quite a bit different. You can see uh, it's uh, the, the exposure has been corrected. Uh, the uh, film, the image has been leveled so it doesn't look like it's on a slope anymore. Uh, you can see the trees more distinctly. You can see a little bit more, it's a little bit of the car. It has been cropped. You'll notice over here that there's a lot of part of the car here. And on this photo, there's only the front part of the car. So you might want to watch things like that. Um, obviously, we're not, we're, are we concerned with the car? We may not we may be concerned with dating the photo, and so knowing which kind of a car that is might be uh, important to uh, to understand. But that's kind of the what it looks like when you've applied just a few um, elements to the photo to uh, edit the the image. Some question about the uh, uh, whether it's uh, ethical to do what uh, to do this. Um, this doesn't fall into the question of ethics. It's when you actually change the photo or change elements within the photo 
or repair photos where there's information missing and add information to the photo. Those are the kinds of things that uh, raise some issues of whether or not you should make those kinds of changes to historical photos. Um, in this case, uh, it just makes it easier for the photo and actually uh, communicates more information than, when, than was in the original print of the photo. Uh, understanding that this print of a photo was made, the original on the left-hand side of the screen, was made from a negative, and there could have been a lot of prints of it. So they could have printed quite a few copies. Not likely in this case, because uh, there was no reason to have a whole bunch of copies of pictures of the high school, unless uh, the photographer, my great-grandmother, was uh, selling them for some reason or uh, using them in a program of some kind or whatever. So um, probably not. Um, that's probably not what happened. But that's a real basic edit of a, of a uh, single tone. Uh, people refer to this as a black and white image. You'll notice that the color is not black and it's not white. Uh, it's, uh, it's kind of a, I can't really give you a, a, a name for the color, but it's certainly not black and white. Uh, it's sort of a, a toned color. And that was, uh, that was created by the type of film that was being used. Now, when you find a photo like this, uh, this is my grandmother, and you find a photo like this and you say, can the photo be fixed? I mean, it looks, it looks almost impossible because uh, you really can't see the face. Uh, the rest of it, part of it seems to be almost in uh, overexposed. And the answer to it is yes, by using uh, programs like sophisticated programs like Lightroom and some of the others. There's not, when I mention the name of the program, it's simply because that's a, kind of a basic tool for, uh, for most professional photographers. But uh, there's others, and there are lots of uh, programs out there that you could take this photo and then you could end up with this. Okay, you can bring out the, some detail from the part that's underexposed. Uh, you can cut down some of the glare uh, from the overexposed area. It wasn't so overexposed that it blew out all the details, so there's a little bit of detail left in the overexposed area. And you certainly get a lot more uh, detail out of the trees and, uh, and the, the other parts of the photo. Uh, you can actually, if you look closely enough, you could probably see what she was holding in her hand there, uh, whatever that is. And in this case, and in all cases, I always suggest minimal changes with um, any kind of a historic photo. Whatever you can do, it should be minimal. Uh, we're not trying to create an art object that we're going to sell in a gallery, or we're not trying to be professional with this. What we're trying to do is salvage as much information as possible from the original photo. So we don't want to go beyond salvaging information. We want to make only the changes which will actually enhance and give information about the original photo. In this case, being able to see a little more detail in the face and in the clothes uh, gives a, a really good, uh, uh, gives a better idea of what's going on. So what did I do here? What was it that I did to, to change this photo from the underexposed copy to this that's a little better? Uh, not completely better. Uh, we could work on, on uh, the, the light uh, from the, uh, by this light that's on the left-hand side here, the, I mean the right-hand side of the image here, that's really that came from the uh, development process, the way it was developed. They developed the photo and um, used, had too much light on that side of the photo. Uh, may have leaked in during the time that the photo was being developed or whatever, but that was uh, that's the photo development issue. So what did I do? Well, the first what I did is I used Lightroom, as I mentioned, but I also adjusted the exposure, which was the amount of light 
that was available in the photo. So there's a way to, to darken and lighten the photo. So I used the exposure adjustment in Lightroom to do that. I added some contrast. That meant that I increased the, the uh, detail of the photo uh, and made it look sharper. Uh, that's, a, that's a very kind of a technical, like there's a technical explanation for how it does that. Uh, but basically understanding that these photos are scanned, so they're made up with a, a, a number of pixels, and you can light and darken certain pixels to make uh, parts of the image appear more distinct than it was previously. I, I increased the um, amount of light in the shadows, and I can do that with uh, a program like Light. Room, I can do that selectively so I can lighten the shadow without adding more light to the parts that are already almost overexposed or completely overexposed. And then I either can cut back on the blacks or I can make the black parts of the photo more, uh, more uh, evident as, you, as we work with the photo. The same with whites, I can make the whites go out back a little bit. And I can increase the texture. That's also like contrast that uh, looks at the actual uh, way that the that the um, image has a texture. The cloth has a texture. The tree has a texture. The hat. Everything has a texture. And as you increase the texture, the the uh, program allows you to bring out that those uh, the texture of the of the photo. So that's what it looks like when it gets through. If you want to go back to the to the one it looked like previously, we'll see the contrast there for just a second. Oh, by the way, this took me about 30 seconds to do. This was not what you would call a great involved process. I just simply uh, been working with these programs for years and years and years. And, and uh, I just looked at that and I just clicked a few things and that was the way it turned out. If I had spent longer, I might have been able to come up with a better photograph altogether. Sometimes if you spend more time that you get, actually the more time I spend on some photographs, it gets to the point where it's so bad after I've ruined so much, I've made so many changes and now it looks just absolutely atrocious. And so then I just dump it and start all over again. That's why it's important to always work off of a copy because you may decide that what you've done is not good and may not be any way to reverse everything. So you may just have to throw it away and, and put it in the trash and have a, have a new copy. Okay, now anything you do with this, um, there is a very steep learning curve. Uh, learning about the basics of photography is one thing. But the problem, of course, is that it, just because you're a genealogist does not mean you want to be a professional photographer. And so it may seem overwhelming to, to get into what is what we would call photography basics. Uh, it might be helpful to take just a basic course in photography. There's lots of them online. You can go on YouTube and get a whole bunch of them. You may have some through your local public library. There may be other uh, courses online that you can you can get for free others for payment uh, you may want to take a class from a local uh, adult education or even from a great other schools uh, many many places have classes on basic photography and uh, all I can say is it's a steep learning curve uh, learning a program like Lightroom uh, I got the program I spent probably three or four weeks trying to figure out how the program worked. And I finally, my brother, who is also a professional photographer, uh, he came over and he, I, I called him finally and I said, hey, you got to come over and help me. And he did. And in about an hour, he told me how the program worked. And from then on, I was able to finally get into, because I never, I just didn't understand the concept. I couldn't understand how the program was set up or how it worked. Um, today, that was years ago, but today I would simply watch 
a uh, an instructional video from my public library or from uh, YouTube, and and I would probably have enough information to to learn the program without any difficulty. So, but I'm saying that there's a lot of information to learn. This is uh, this program. This image is. Um, I mentioned my grandfather, my father, and my uncle. And uh, you can see there's very little detail because of how dark the wood is. And then there's little detail in my grandfather's face because of his hat. And um, so that's kind of, a, of, of an interesting photo, but it's got some problems. So let's see what we can do to the photo. So that was taking that photo and working with it for uh, you know, some period of time, for me, a matter of a few minutes, uh, I was able to bring out that uh, more detail in it. Uh, what was the expense of that? Well, the expense of that was that on the wood, now instead of it all being dark, we have places where it's a little bit overexposed. And uh, up here on the top of his head, it's overexposed. But you have, the trade-off is that you're going to have uh, to get the balance and get the optimal, you have to work with it going back and forth. And, and a lot of this is done with sliders. So you can simply slide back and forth with the program and, and uh, adjust that particular amount of, of uh, the image until you get what you think is the best quality there. Now, there's another possibility, and that is out there today, there are um, websites that will let you colorize the photo. And one of the major ones for genealogists is uh, myheritage.com. And uh, if you have access to myheritage.com, you also have access to being able to upload a photo like this and colorize the photo. So that's another thing we could do to it. But we'll show you that in just a minute. But let me go through the steps of what I actually did to change this photo. Up here on the uh, left-hand side is the original photo. That's what it looked like originally. And then I moved from the original. I did The first thing I did was I adjusted the exposure. Uh, this was uh, underexposed. So when you're underexposed, you can move the exposure up and lighten it up. Uh, the uh, trade-off is, you'll see up here in the clouds, there was some detail. And uh, the roof of this house, of the shed, I guess it's a shed back there, uh, had some detail. There was a tree. And if you look at the new, the new photo, you'll see that the tree's gone. The, the roof of the shed has, has been uh, uh, overexposed out. It's been uh, wiped out by the by the color and all of the cloud detail is gone. Uh, so that's the problem with the photo. So now the next step was to see what I could capture back. And so I adjusted the shadows. A lot of the shadows were, were dark. And so we decided, I decided, well, we'll lighten up the shadows. We'll see more of the wood detail here, uh, a little bit more of the clothing detail, obviously quite a bit more here, especially in the face of my grandfather. And then we go down here to the next step, and I cut down the highlights. Now, the highlights, uh, you'll see the difference here on the roof of the structure. Looking up back here, you'll see it's almost uh, entirely overexposed. And when I cut down on the highlights, it actually brought back some of the roof and you're starting to see some clouds come back into the photo and uh, some more detail uh, in the image of the shirt and things like that that uh, start to show up more uh, when you make uh, an adjustment to the highlights. So the next step was the final one, and that's add a little bit more exposure, um, adjust the exposure again, and that brought out some more of the clouds. Uh, by the way, there's some part of the camera, once again, this camera that was being used during this time apparently was defective. Uh, and this is, uh, part of this has, has to do with the, um, um, with the actual development of the photo, so the way it was developed. 
Okay, so now we have what I would consider to be a, a pretty good photo. Um, if it was important enough, I would uh, uh, be glad to be glad to spend some more time on it and try to improve it a little bit more. Uh, I can't fix some of the things in the photo. They're just not there. There's a graininess here. Uh, we think of digital photos being made up of little discrete uh, elements on the sensor. And uh, when they're created they're, uh, and viewed, they're viewed with pixels, little tiny dots of, of uh, color and, and uh, shades and everything that make up the photos. But, but photographic film is the same. There's a grain on the photographic film. There's a limit to the resolution of photographic film, just as there is with uh, a digital sensor. And uh, so it, uh, the grain here is starting to show up in the uh, in the image. Uh, there's not a whole lot more we can do with this image to uh, to make it so that it's um, it's better because I can't fix the sky. What if I try to colorize this? Um, I upload this photo to uh, my heritage, and they do an interesting job of colorizing it. And I need to also mention that the tools that I used may or may not be available in the program you choose to use. So, uh, you know, the, the standard uh, disclaimer about uh, your results may vary. And the answer is yes, your results may vary a lot <laughs> because uh, the uh, level of sophistication of the program may only allow you to uh, make certain uh, sort of standardized changes to a photo, like the ones that I mentioned with uh, Google Photos online. And um, and so you you just may never be able to get uh, some of the detail using those programs. That does not mean, by the way, that you couldn't get more detail. But like I mentioned earlier, there is a steep learning curve. There is a time involved in learning how these programs work. So you may work with something and, and get some pretty good results and, and be happy with what you have. But if you decide to move over to the next one, there is some, some effort involved. Here's the colorizing. Uh, what would that do to the photo? Um, it's, uh, it adds a little bit. It's, uh, it's an interesting process that they've developed. Uh, it does bring out some details because the color in the face gives you some shading and things so that you can actually see um, more definition in the clothing. Uh, Obviously, the wood pile looks a little better, so it's uh, you know it's it's a it's it's a good process. It's an amazing process. So you go to uh, to myheritage.com. Now, what if I colorize the original photo, the one that was all dark and awful? Well, that's uh, that's what that would look like. Colorization doesn't solve the basic problems with the image. What about a really bad original? I can't do anything with this photo. This was called scrubbing. They scrubbed the, the plate. So here was the photographic plate. They scrubbed the plate, and then they printed the scrubbed plate. Why did they do this? They didn't like the face, and this was an early photo editing process. Some, what would happen eventually with this photo is that uh, my grandmother, great-grandmother, would then superimpose another head on that photo. Okay, so they were doing that way back in the old days when the things were doing how about this photo? Is there anything I can do with this photo? The answer is not a whole lot. The information in this photo was lost in the original. There's just nothing you can do to bring out the, any more information in that photo. I worked with this for a little while and it just kept getting worse. There's nothing I could do to get the faces. They weren't there. They, the information was never there. How about improving the original? Okay, so this is an original. It's a nice photo. It's really quite nice, but it's kind of overexposed. So if I underexpose it a little, take down the exposure a little bit, uh, it's quite a different photo. By the way, this photo was scrubbed. If you look around the head, you'll see uh, like kind of a color, light color area. Uh, so I'm not sure that this was actually the original photo or not. I think there's a line uh, on the neck that shows that this may have been 
the face may have been stuck in on this photo. So early photoshopping. Colorization doesn't do it. Doesn't do anything to this photo. There were no color. There's no color there. It was all black and white. Um, and even though you color the face a little bit, it doesn't change it at all. Okay. But please be aware that colorization can make a tremendous difference in a photo. This is a uh, obviously a, a class graduation or final photo of the year kind of thing. Uh, notice the hairstyles. Uh, notice the dresses. Notice the hairstyles on the boys. Um, a lot of MIRVs are back in fashion today, by the way. It's kind of interesting, at least ones on the boys. I see people around me that look like that. Okay, but here's what happens when you do colorization with this photo. Dramatic difference. And this is on uh, myheritage.com. Uh, and uh, you might want to investigate the colorization that's on that, on that website with photos. Now you have a photo like this, a uh, nice photo, big family here. This happens to be the Overson family. And uh, my grandmother's, uh, the middle of the photo right here, this is my grandmother. And uh, I'm sure my father's uh, someplace in this picture, but I can't figure out which one of the kids he is. He's probably a baby at this time. Um, no, well, it wouldn't have been. My father wouldn't have been in the photo because this is my grandmother, and she's not old enough to get married. She didn't get married until she was like in her 30s, so that's okay. I don't have to look for my father. That's why I couldn't find him. But uh, just a, a kind of a minimal amount of, of editing on this photo. All I did was increase the, the, do a little bit with the exposure and do a little bit with the contrast. So this is, this is uh, what you can do. And there is absolutely, from my perspective, this doesn't approach anything having to do with ethics. This has to do with making the information available that's already there in the photo. Small changes can make a big difference, so don't think you have to do it. Can we fix this? Okay, well, I showed you this torn photo earlier. Uh, the answer is yes, we can. The time and effort to making the edits has to be measured against the need to restore the image. That means, very simply, that how long it's going to take me to work that, that torn image out of there and the rest of the problems with this photo has to be offset against how much value is there in what I'm doing. What's wrong with the photo? Well, you may offend your sensibilities of some kind uh, because you're looking at a torn photo, but it was torn. That's the photo. Um, you know, that's what we have. If this were the only photo of these two individuals, who happened to be my grandfather, grandmother and her brother, then that would might be worth all the time I could possibly spend. But we have dozens, hundreds of photos of these people since my grand, great grandmother, her mother was a professional photographer and she loved to take pictures of her kids. I ended up with over 4,000 pictures from my great-grandmother and that. By the way, that collection of her photos is, is now housed at the University of Arizona in their, um, their photographic collections and it's available. Uh, you can find that online. There you go. That's what happens. And this probably took me a, an hour, a couple of hours, an hour, an hour and a half of work. A little bit frustrating. I didn't. I got kind of uh, to the point where I wasn't going to try to fix some of the other problems with uh, the photo, such as this line that comes across here, because it wasn't on the vase. And there's a little bit of weird stuff here because the photo is hard to kind of reconstruct the face so that it actually looked like what it was supposed to look like at the time. And so I would just. Um, you know, in other words, there's a law of diminishing returns. The more you work on it, the worse it looks. So basically, you have to quit while you're ahead and uh, take whatever it is that you can get from the restoration. There are people who do this professionally who restore photos, and uh, uh, it was uh, it's something that uh, they could do. So what are the ethics? The ethics are this. What's wrong with this picture? 
it took uh, takes a minute to figure out what's wrong unless I flip back to the original. Yes, I can take someone out of the photo and they're gone. So if you don't like your relatives and you don't want their picture, you simply can edit them out of the photo. Okay, but I happen to like these relatives and so that's not something that we do with a photo. Okay, now I, this is <clears throat> at the end of most of all my uh, presentations and webinars, I always have a thanks for watching photo that I've taken. And uh, I, basically um, the question is how much, uh, what's, been, what's been done to this photo? Uh, let's just say, believe me, it didn't look like that when it came out of the camera. Uh, the balance, the sky, the everything you can see about this photo has been changed, enhanced, and, and redone. Now, what is the ethics of changing this photo and taking someone out or putting someone in? The issue there is the history, the, historis the, the history of the photo, the history that's being represented is being changed. And that is not historically acceptable. So when you start sticking people in because, oh, they missed Uncle George, so we'll just kind of Photoshop Uncle George into the photo. What you've done then is you've created a, a, a place and time when Uncle George wasn't there, which may create a confusion forever in a family that uh, uh, may or may not have tried to trace Uncle George's movements. Uh, but in this case, when you've taken out a person that is central to the photo and important in the photo, uh, it really begins to, to change what the view of history is. So it's, it's not, uh, not a good idea to get overwhelmed by the technology and start taking out everybody that's there. Okay, well, thanks for watching. Uh, remind everyone that these webinars are uh, uploaded and uh, housed on the BYU Family History Library YouTube channel. And even though we are in the middle of the pandemic and uh, the library is closed, we are sitting in our various locations around the, the, the world or around the, wherever we are and uh, putting out webinars uh, on a on a schedule that uh, is available on the BYU Family History Library website. So we'll turn this back over to Brian. Thanks so much, James. Thanks for your great presentation. If anyone has any questions, please post them in the chat box and James can answer them for us. Must not be a lot of questions, Brian. It looks like we have one question from Rob, and it says, what's the difference between Lightroom and Photoshop? OK, well, Lightroom is a um, photo storage program. It's, it's organized for people with lots of photos. I mean, you could put. Uh, you can catalog and, and display uh, collections of hundreds of thousands of photos in Lightroom and find them and classify them and add metadata uh, labels to them. Uh, and it also has a very, very sophisticated photo editing capability. So it does basically all of the things that uh, someone who was involved very heavily in hundreds or thousands of you have to be into the thousands to really make it worth all the effort. But uh, if you have thousands of photos that you need to work with, Lightroom simplifies that whole process. Once you learn the program, then it becomes almost indispensable. There are other programs out there that do similar things, and but they are also similarly priced. So there's not, you can't get away from the fact that that's, that it is an expensive program. Photoshop is the basic editing program. 
uh, Lightroom does not have the photo editing capabilities of Photoshop. In other words, if I want to repair the torn photo, I can't do it with Lightroom. I have to go into Photoshop and use Photoshop's tools for, um, for repairing the photo. Uh, they have some amazing tools. A lot of the simple stuff like uh, problems you might have of, of taking out a person that you not really didn't need belong in the photo, like uh, somebody walked into the photo at the last minute and you don't need them there. Or if you want to, uh, to dramatically change the, uh, the way that the photo looks, uh, then Photoshop is the program that has the almost extensive um, detail. The interesting thing about you can become a certified master of Photoshop through Adobe if you know uh, at least a hundred of the features. Figure that out. That's like how many features do they have? Let's just say a lot more than a hundred. <laughs> And so it's if you know a hundred of the basic features, you're already a master of the program. So it's it's one of those programs that you can always figure out some way to do something else. And most of the really sophisticated kind of uh, uh, when you've got like almost fantasy where people have manipulated the light and put in, you know, spaceships and stuff like all that's done in Photoshop, or or a similar similar programs of which there are a few that our competitors of Photoshop. Okay, any other questions? Looks like we have one more. It says, what about options for water damage? Oh, well, damage is damage. So whatever it is, mold, uh, water, uh, torn out of the, of the album, glued down, uh, ruined the photo by gluing it, uh, any of those things, some of those things can be repaired. Some of them can't. Uh, it's easy to, uh, once you get into understanding and working with with doing these photos, we've been doing, I've been doing this now for probably 30 years of working with Photoshop. And um, I can just look at the photo and tell whether I can, I can actually fix it. Uh, tears, things like that are not simple, but they're doable. Uh, when it's got a extensive water damage and 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 the image has uh, it it gets really it gets really difficult. Some of it can be repaired, and is glad and it's a good thing to have it to work with. I think we've got a buzzer going here. Um, any other questions? Yeah, we got a couple more. Uh, Sue Ann asked, "I found hundreds of slides in my father's workshops. How do I save and store them?" Um, okay, S slide slide photos are, um, I think we've set off a smoke alarm here. I hope you can't hear that. But um, slides require some, some uh, special handling. Uh, at the BYU Family History Library, we have some very, uh, very efficient slide uh, duplication, digitization uh, devices. We have uh, some that use a, a Nikon camera to digitize the slides, and another one that uses a flatbed scanner. Uh, I believe it's a Canon flatbed scanner. You can buy a Canon flatbed scanner that will digitize slides, or an Epson, or a um, or any of the other major uh, HP and others, all of which advertise uh, scanners that start at about $200 that will scan slides. Um, the, the quality of uh, getting the scanner is a little bit except is a little bit um, out of um, the range of most people that they want to spend on it. Uh, it's better just to find some place where you can bring the slides, or or there are services that will digitize the slides for you. Um, might want to check to see the quality. I seen some poor quality digital slides from professional scanners. But um, that's it's there's there's a way to do that if you just but it does take some time and money. We scanned um, my father did slide scans took slides for years and between my brother and I we've probably scanned uh, three or four thousand slides and um, 
the quality on the slides. I scanned a lot of the old slides that I had, and the quality comes out pretty bad. But a lot of that can be fixed if they're just pulled into Lightroom or Photoshop or some other program. Great. Um, uh, one Another question says, when scanning, what DPI do you use that is best for alterations? Well, the higher the DPI you get, you have to understand that there's only a certain amount of information in a photograph. So uh, despite the fact that you can scan it supposedly with uh, the new scanners they're advertising, you can scan at 3 and 4, 2400 DPI and 4, 40,000 DPI, but if that, that's ridiculous. That's not even, it doesn't make any sense at all. The, the real issue is what is practical and what is, uh, what makes sense. And 300 DPI is the, is the standard. Uh, you can get that out of the, if you go to the Library of Converse, Congress, uh, digital preservation website, you'll find that they're, they consistently state that 300 dpi digital images are are archive quality uh, i tend to scan at about if i'm going to do trying to get archive quality scan at four to six hundred dpi but higher than that you're just using up a lot more space you get a bigger photo bigger print out of it but you don't get any you don't get any more detail and so i would just say three to four hundred Maybe five, 600 if you're, you have to play around with it a lot and see how you feel and what you think about the detail. But the more detail you have, the, 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 the easier it is to make uh, repairs and changes. Awesome. And then I think we'll take this last question. It says, have you used fluid mount to scan a negative? Fluid mount? What is, I don't understand what they're asking. I'm sorry. Oh, it might be a program. Oh, is it a program? Fluid now. Yeah. Yeah, no. perhaps. Yeah, I'm, I'm not familiar with that particular program. There's um, most of the scanning, most of the scanners themselves have their own scanning software. So if you go to a Kodak film scanner, then they have Kodak film scanning. If you go to a, a, a scanner that's that works with a Nikon Canon. They'll have a Nikon Canon scanning program, and if you do Canon, they all have their own. So each of the devices usually comes with their own scanning software. Great. Um, looks like we have one more. It says, "Do you save as a JPEG or um, is that or TIFF?" Um, I kind of go back and forth. Um, uh, JPEG is known as what's called a lossy format, meaning that if you edit JPEG images, uh, they tend to lose uh, information, lose detail, lose, you know, whatever. The more you, you edit it and copy it, every time you copy and make an edit uh, change to the photo, that then you're going to get less information. Most of the photos that I'm scanning now are documents, and most of the ones that I'm, the photographs that I'm scanning are photographs that I'm not going to, to edit at all. I'm not even going to bother changing anything in the photo. Uh, there just isn't a time in the world for me to do that. And so JPEGs work just great, and they are a kind of a universal format, and uh, as long as you're not getting involved, but if you're trying to do professional work and you want archival quality, uh, Library of Congress once again says you can do JPEGs or TIFFs. TIFFs are a lossless format. The file size is quite big. Uh, that used to be a consideration when we didn't have ultra cheap storage capabilities. Uh, right now, the, that, the big argument back in the old days was because TIFF files were so much bigger and they took up so much storage space. Today, that is totally inconsequential. Nobody cares. You can buy a one terabyte hard drive for about 130 bucks, and that'll take 5,000 to 10,000 photos, depending on how you, or more, 
thousands and thousands of photos. I have, I used uh, eight terabyte hard drives and um, I have hundreds of thousands of photos on their hard drives. So there's just some storage and the type of, of thing is up to you. TIFF files are a little bit, um, they're not, none of them matter. It doesn't matter what format it's in. Uh, the, the editing programs will work with almost any format. Perfect. Thanks so much, James. And thank you okay. once. Yeah, I think that'll be it. Um, and thanks everyone for joining us. Just want to remind you about our webinar next week on Wednesday at 5.30 p.m. Um, that'll be June 3rd, How to Use the Family Search Wiki and Catalog. And that'll be with Amber Oldenburg. So we hope to see you there next time and okay. have a great day.